There are so many things about me that probably shouts like, you shouldn't be doing this. Your back is twisted. You've got restrictions all over. You've got a bunion on your foot. All these kind of quirky things that I'm proud that I have. And I just see it as like, why not? This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who thinks a fresh, juicy peach is the best fruit? Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 80 of Running For Real. Thank you so much for joining me today for this episode. If you are new here, welcome. I am really happy to have you. If you are a regular listener, welcome back. And thanks so much for tuning in. I know there are plenty of podcasts you could be listening to. So thanks for listening to this one. So last week we talked to Matt Davis of Obstacle Racing Media and we talked about a really important topic, which is depression. Matt was recently diagnosed with bipolar and has been very public about his struggle and he wants to get the conversation going about depression. Even if you're someone who hasn't personally dealt with depression, it's a really good episode to learn more about it and know what to look for in people you know and love. And if you subscribe to the Running For Real podcast through your favorite podcast player today, how you're listening right now, you will find it easy or you can find it in the show notes. And uh, that way you can get back to next week's, last week's episode and tune in to future week's episodes. So today I have a British athlete who you probably haven't heard of unless you're British yourself, but she's definitely someone to watch. And Mila Gorechka is someone I remember seeing win races from very early on. But what impressed me about her was that she was always there. Quite a few years younger than me, but she never seemed to disappear with injuries like other runners did. And you will hear about just how long she went without injuries today. Almost unheard of. I also wanted to bring her on the show as she has scoliosis. And that's something we have covered. uh, We haven't ever covered in the show. And I thought it was about time that we did. She hid it from everyone she knew, well, most people that she knew, obviously a few people had to know, but from the running world for a really long time. And it makes her results even more impressive. She holds the British record for the mile as an under 15 and as an under 17. And she ran that time uh, in the mile 446, which is incredibly impressive. That's faster than my personal best as a fully grown adult, let alone running it when she was 14. And she also, as I said, holds the 3k under 15 and under 17 record and she's run 1507 in the 5k pretty nice work right I wanted Amelia on the show as she's real and she's had a lot of success early on and may have struggled in recent years but decided to do a complete rebuild that you're going to hear about today and I think that's really inspiring that she decided to break herself down and start again and I love the analogy that she uses when she talks about this All right, that's enough from me. We are going to meet Amelia. Oh, but one more thing before I do. You may notice in today's episode that I I ask some questions that come from what I call Patreon supporters. And you too can give your questions that I will ask my guests in the future. And you will know way in advance who I'm going to be interviewing by signing up to support me through Patreon. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash running for real. Right, let's meet our sponsors and then on to Amelia. You know, I genuinely care about the brands that I choose to share with you. That's why I turned down a big brand recently as I really dislike their product, so I backed out. But I'm so excited to introduce you to a new sponsor, Bomber Socks. It is just in time for marathon season and I'm always telling you that you need to practice with your outfit before the day. Well, now's the perfect time to get some new socks to wear on race day and I'll tell you about why I love them so much later in the show. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. Perfect Amino has been supporting me and my training for years now and I need it even more now I'm trying to get back into running. I forgot how sore you get when you start running again, but at least I know I have something in my corner to help me recover. Remember, coupon code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. Amelia, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. I am really excited to talk to you. I have looked up to you for such a long time, which sounds funny 
as you're quite a bit younger than me, but I really have looked up to you for so many reasons, many of which we'll talk about today. But thanks so much for being here today. No, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I've been listening to podcasts for quite a long time now. So this is my first one, actually. Really? So this is, That's yeah. Um, well, hopefully so it's many exciting more. and I'm going to try and talk really slowly and I'm going to try and make sense, which is <laughs> difficult for me because I talk a lot and I waffle. So um, good luck to everyone listening. Yeah, <laughs> well, they're used to it with me because I do that too. So no pressure. Um, whatsoever because they're used to it all right so I wanted to kind of start at the beginning um you know many of my listeners are American um but people are you know I talked in the intro about some of the things you've achieved um you're you know having the British uh record for the under 15 under 17 age groups uh, particularly mile and 3k but um you know winning European championships uh, you have a lot of like accolades to your name but you're actually very successful from a very young age you know as young as 11 if that if I read that right and um firstly I kind of wanted to talk about you know a lot of girls who succeed girls and guys but particularly girls who succeed at that young age either really struggle in those late teenage years and give up or just kind of struggle away for years and years until maybe eventually they kind of come back. So how how did you feel that you were able to kind of continue, you know, you've had your ups and downs, obviously, but continue doing well from age 11, pretty much to now age 23 or 24, are you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess initially it always comes back to enjoyment. I always enjoyed it. Um, and I was really grateful to find something that I was good at at a young age. I wasn't good at um, dancing or netball or any of the other sports. So running quickly became my thing. And yeah, I guess the achievements that I had just came naturally without any pressure. Um, I feel really lucky to have a family that were just always supportive and they would take me anywhere across the country. Mm. Um, and my friends are so understanding. So there was never an issue. There was never a, a forcing, uh, or an intense kind of atmosphere around what I was doing. It was just exciting. And every year I was like, wow, how can it get better? And then the next year it just got better. And I was like, Oh God. Um, and I also was healthy throughout the whole period. So I actually got my first ever injury, proper injury when I was 21. Which is very impressive. Yeah, really. Like, I mean, young females, particularly with stress fractures, is coming quite a regular story, unfortunately. Um, and people would come away from sessions and say that this or that hurt, their calves were tight. And I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't know what that kind of pain was. Um, so I had a very big chunk of my uh, teenage years injury-free, healthy. Um, the only thing that held me back was the old sickness. I was quite illness prone, but I think consistently helped throughout the whole period um, and enjoyment. And it just like, you mentioned those records there. I forgot I even had them. It just kind of happened and you just go with it. And I was part of a training environment where we had a lot of females in the group yeah. and they were actually, majority of them were actually older than me looking back, but you just form a kind of like family environment where everyone's in it together. And the next thing I know I'm 24 and (laughs) I'm grown up. So it happened quickly, but like I would, I wouldn't say naturally there weren't many bumps in the road and I do think that's rare and I am quite lucky to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just a side note before we go on any further, you did mention that you were susceptible to illness Um, as you know, illness is pretty much a natural part of, of running and particularly for someone who, uh, is listening and maybe training for one goal race and happens to get ill or sick like the week of um did you learn anything that that helped a lot with when it came to you know maybe a week to two or three days before the race when something would come up really good question because um throughout the whole of my childhood like when you're a kid you're oblivious you don't think about it so I'd get ill going into nationals and you just get on with it. You almost don't feel the illness. You don't get paranoid. You, you're not got sensitivities of your body that you develop as you get older. Now that I'm older, it, it's definitely become more of a thing for me. And funnily enough, at the beginning of the season, um, unfortunately I caught a virus and I didn't realize I had it for a while. And I came out with this horrible cold before my first ever 10k on the track. And 
that whole week I was just like uh, taking gin, ginger and turmeric drinks and trying my best to like detox the body in time for the race. And I would say now looking back, I should have just let it all go. And yes, you can, you know, you can sleep and you can eat and relax, but almost zone out from it. Um, I think I had a tendency to probably uh, overthink about like, okay, this is now the cost stage of this illness. I've got to get this bit out. And I was uh, documenting this illness too much going into the race. Yeah. And the best thing for me would have just been to um, not think about it as much, I guess. And that's really hard. Mm -hmm. But sleeping and eating always helps um, because your body's trying to recover. So you you can have your ginger and turmeric drinks or whatever makes you feel good about yourself. But almost just letting it go and trusting that the training's there. Um, Because that doesn't go, you're just not maybe feeling as good. But um, this year was the first year I've ever gone into a race with that awareness of being ill. And, um, yeah, it was definitely a learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Kids, you don't think about it, but as you get older, annoyingly, you do. And, yeah. um, yeah, it's a good lesson for me to just chill out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much of it is the psychological aspect of it. I actually ran my half marathon PB with, uh, like pretty ill, like two days before. I was like, I'm not, I'm not racing. Like, I'm, can't do this. And then I ended up, you know, I think I could have run faster, but I still, I still ran well. And I, so, yeah, I wonder how much of it is I went into that race, like, whatever you know I'm ill I'm just going to do my best and uh and I ended up running pretty well and just being like determined to do the best I could but yeah I wonder if if you are kind of going into it thinking oh no how is this going to affect me I'm going to run slower I'm not going to hit this time I'm not going to be able to stay with these people but what you just said there makes it think maybe it is with especially when it comes to kids like you said just you just get on with it isn't it's no big deal but uh just thought I would ask you that there now you mentioned um about you know you uh, I can't remember if we said this a few minutes ago or if it was just when we were talking before, but you actually um, went through puberty starting or, you know, you got your first period at age 13. Um, so tell us about, you know, did your body change shape that early? And did, you know, how did you handle the kind of changes in body shape that I know a lot of, you know, uh, teenage girls particularly go through when, being, you know, the hips kind of widen out and you get boobs and just your your whole body changes? Yeah, I didn't get much of the boobs, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, um, I, I think uh, yeah, genetically, I am quite, I like to use the word elongated rather than length. Um, but I am quite, yeah, elongated. Um, so I've always been a little bit tiny. So my hips didn't grow enormously. Um, I don't ever remember seeing a significant change in that. Um, I grew quite steadily. Um, there wasn't any random growth spurts I think males might experience so the, yeah I was I was probably quite lucky and the periods are regular as well so and you said you started at age 13 and you mentioned to me before we started recording that you feel like that kind of gave you a jump start maybe explain what you meant by that to listeners yeah in terms of a healthy body um I think the sign of a period for me it tells me that my body's ready like and it's healthy um so I must have been eating well which I've got a reputation for eating very well sometimes too well <laughs> um so it was a sign that I was like ready to kind of I don't know whether I grow up and yeah. I was eating well. my body had the right nutrients um otherwise I wouldn't have had a period every month for as long as I can remember so um the only time I, I probably didn't have a period was when it moved a week or two because I traveled mm-hmm. So that consistent for me for me was a sign that I was good yeah. and healthy and that helped with being injury free and that whole consistency that I was talking about as, as a kid, yeah, it comes down to loads of factors, but I was just really fortunate to have a really smooth journey in that sense. Mm-hmm. I had the cramps, but uh, everyone does, I think. Everyone does. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, related to that, you said you you called yourself um, elongated or, or lanky, if uh, I'm sure the Americans mm. listening are wondering what that means, but you can probably guess by now. Um, mm. But did you ever kind of have the, the worry as a teenager about, um, you know, you had to be thinner or you had to be a certain weight or look a certain way? Was there any kind of pressure on you for that or because you were naturally quite slim, although, you know, maybe your weight has changed 
uh, you know, from time to time, as you mentioned, eating well and too well and stuff. Um, have you had any concerns with that kind of stuff or feeling any pressure for it? I haven't. Um, personally, I had an environment with the training group that I grew up in, but there were a lot of females and we actually all had very different body shapes. So um, I just feel lucky that I never, I never looked at anyone and thought, man, I'm going to be, I want to be like that Mm -hmm. or I need to change. Um, I definitely had uh, probably I'd say bigger quads when I was a kid because I was a big heel striker and I loaded my quads a lot more than I do now. So I probably did put on weight there, but I was like almost uh, a show off in the sense that I'd be like, with my school friends, we'd go out for dinner and I would almost overindulge in the food to be like, look what I can eat <laughs> and I'm going for a run tomorrow. <laughs> and there was like an almost proud element of I can eat, you know, as a kid, whatever I want and I'm strong. Yeah. And I had that. And I also think that was probably encouraged by, yes, the training setup I was in, there were never any negative comments about body image. And then my family as well, like, I grew up with two boys, so I was like the third boy and we'd all eat and like we would split chocolate so evenly between us because we wanted the exact same amount mm. and just were all greedy. So there was never a, an issue. Um, and I, I remember actually my coach and um, my previous coach saying to me at one point, um, you, you've got a similar body to uh, Joe Pavey, who was a big idol to me. And I just remember thinking that was awesome. Mm-hmm. I never thought like, I don't want to have that image. I don't want to be muscly. Mm -hmm. I just, I think I saw running well as the priority and nothing ever took that. Yeah. That's so good that you had that, especially from a young age, because I get that's something that you can kind of get as you get older, you know, you get quote unquote wise, but to have that mindset as a, as a teenager and it just that's that's so special and so I wonder how much of it is your brothers playing into it as well that you know they were never kind of worrying about um you know the extra like piece of chocolate like you said or making a difference and and that allowed you to just kind of you know eat for see it in the guy guy way of things which often is you know food is fuel I know with my husband I kind of used to get in not an argument with him but I'd say to him you know, oh, we need to go here because it's really good. And he's like, it's just food. And I was like, no, 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 it's not just yeah. food. It's <laughs> it's really awesome. good. And yeah, so, um, okay. And one more thing before we move on, you know, anyone listening, you know, with kids or maybe even a school age runner themselves, um, you know, you mentioned that you went through your first injury at age 21, but you must have seen it all around um, with people kind of um, you know, doing well uh, as a younger teenager, uh, preteen, as they say over here, and then kind of hitting a wall, slowing down, struggling, saying, I can't run fast anymore, or I'm really slowing down. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying harder and harder and it's not coming together. Do you have any advice based on what you saw around you or maybe just what you learned age 21 when you did get those injuries? Um. Yeah, in terms of um, slowing down and getting injury, or just slowing yeah, down just because kind of either or, like you know, you everything is going so well and you're running so well, and then all of a sudden it's, it's either injuries or you just can't run fast anymore. Yeah, I think like I, I guess runners always have the obsession of I want to get better and I want to improve, and that we're very competitive. And um, for me, the sign of an injury or an illness. Um, is always an, is an indicator to me that my body is not happy mm. and that I have to probably uh, change something slightly. Nothing's drastic, but I kind of have to look inward and see why is this happening. Um, I have quite a big thing about the word why. As long as I know why, then I can happily like move forward with my life <laughs> and live it. Um, so understanding why is something happening. And if, you, if you're just slowing down because you're tired, then it's a you've got to stop and adjust and stop pushing for that competitive instinct that we all have. And similar with my injury, I had to stop and and readjust a lot of things. And yes, the priority was always, I wanted to run quick, but there was more, (laughs) there was, there was more going on behind the scenes that meant why was I getting injured? This is why. And I can fix this if I think about it properly. So, um, it should never be a panic station, but I can understand how people do panic and, 
want it now, now, now. And I tell you what, it doesn't happen quickly. Nothing happens quickly. So whether it's an injury or an illness, just try and figure out why it's happening and regroup and starting again or changing something will help you in the long run. Mm -hmm. And got to like kind of see that long run. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And would you say any part of it is kind of almost the harder you it's not a case of trying harder. It's often a case of stepping back. Like, I feel like that's the the danger zone we get ourselves in. Well, I'm trying harder than I was before. I'm trying so hard. I'm so committed. And it's often mm. go back the other way, to step back, like you said, and figure out why this is happening. Yeah. I mean, it's when you said try hard, it reminds me of the quote, uh, go hard or go home. And I've always said, well, why can't I do both? Why can't I go hard and then have a nap? <laughs> like. <laughs> But to me, like, I think, again, uh, it, it might be the way that things are being portrayed in sport, but everyone thinks going harder means better. And sometimes, it, it, I would say the majority of the time, it's actually being smarter. Mm-hmm. And if you can get that drilled into a younger athlete's head early, then you're probably saving them from a lot of stress growing mm-hmm. up. Um, and I, I have definitely seen that where everyone wants to try hard and they've got the best intentions, but it's not smart and the body won't last. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's not always about trying hard. We all know how to try hard because that's what runners do. (laughs) Very well. (laughs) Okay. So let's talk about one thing that you, we've mentioned now a few times that you did have some issues, um, injury a few years ago, which kind of, um, may or may not have been related. You can tell us in a minute, um, to what I'm going to ask you about. Um, you were diagnosed with scoliosis pretty early on. So firstly, for those who don't know, what is it? And then how did it affect you in the early years? And we'll go on to talk about later on. Um, yeah, so scoliosis means curvature of the spine. Um, and in my case, my spine is the shape of a question mark. The degrees are probably about 27 degrees and 33, 34 as a double curvature. And that also comes with uh, muscular rotation on the back. So one of my uh, scapulars is raised up and the other lower half of the back on the opposite side is raised up um, as like a kind of, I don't like to use the word deformity, but like a muscle twist in the body to accommodate for the spine rotating. So it, it is kind of visibly quite clear um, for people. If you're looking for it, you'll, you'll see it straight away. Um, and I was diagnosed when I was 13 and I fell over in a session and I just went to the physio to get checked over and she ran her fingers up my back and just looked to my dad and said, do you realize that this is bending? And then we were like, well, obviously not. <laughs> um, we didn't realize the thing. Um, and quite quickly after that, I got... Um, sent to the hospital uh, to see a consultant and for the next five, six years of my life, it was quite regular x-rays and checkups because the danger is, is that the uh, spine can progress in your adolescent growth spurt. Um, It's a stage that you might need surgery. Mm. And for me, this was genetic. It wasn't like everyone says that it's running related and um, it's a hundred percent genetic. My grandmother gave it to me. She's lovely. And, um, it took about a year to a year and a half to be told that I need to be in a body brace and it's either body bracing the spine up um, or risking surgery in the future. Mm-hmm. So that was a tough moment for me because it was the way the consultant said it. And at, at this point in my kind of running career, I was really enjoying doing well and mm-hmm. running for my and the way he worded it was you're not going to be able to train properly anymore with this like the whole running stuff probably might not happen for you um and um and my mum in there with me and she just saw the tears start to slowly come I'm not like a big crier I'm not dramatic but the tears started to come down and so she was like can we not negotiate this because um the body brace had to basically be on for on my body for 23 hours a day to have an effect um, and the only way I can describe it is it's like a fiberglass plastic corset that I had around my body and we've tightened it up at the back mm-hmm. and it's um, molded especially for my spine to hold me in place 
almost like you know when you tie the uh, you have those um braces around trees to let them grow straight almost yeah, yeah. that's what i was put in like a human one mm-hmm. um for 23 hours a day for three to four years i want to say um which drastically changed my life but i was able to train with it because the one hour i took it off i went for a run or did a session and, and so was that all you were able to do like you had to kind of let's say you had like a, a hard session to do did you have to be like okay I've got we've got an hour to get this in or was it kind of like a ticking ticking thing or were you like oh it's been an hour and a half that's okay so initially it was I was very anal with it because I was terrified of breaking the rules and quite a goody goody um and I even tried going for runs with the brace to try and save time and the brace kind of popped over the top of my glute so I couldn't really mm. run properly mm-hmm. yeah in time you get a bit more relaxed with it as long as you know you're stabilizing the spine but it was yeah an hour to two hours a day like max out of it obviously I had to shower and stuff um and you have to wash the brace as well because it ends up stinking and there's a lot of maintenance involved but it's crazy when I talk about it now because it was an actual reality for me and it seemed like a completely different world yeah. having to live in that like we had to buy I know it sounds silly and I should be grateful as like a teenage girl but we had to buy a brand new wardrobe to fit over it and I just had to buy lots of baggy dresses because it was quite big and we my mom really helped me through that time to kind of like grow in confidence with it and I, I guess it was a big turning point for me with regards to becoming a bit more confident and being comfortable in myself as well it was more of a personal thing um throughout that time for me it was really interesting and yeah like I said I look back and think that's a completely different world now I can't imagine doing that and sleeping in it as well and, and, it was and pretty crazy. you mentioned about the the doctor kind of saying I don't know if running's going to work for you but did it make you more like you know what I'm going to prove you wrong and kind of make you more determined within your running to like step it up a notch a hundred percent it was such a I think that all happened subconsciously and it was something that I actually kept kept quite private to me I didn't tell many people I had it I didn't want to be seen to have a problem turning up to a race I would take off the brace in private warm up put it back on and the faces of the people that did see it were just shocked that I was taking this massive plastic thing off my body. And that was quite cool getting responses from people. Um, I do remember in my first probably big race since wearing the brace, I was really nervous and I didn't know why. And I actually ended up throwing up in the warm up. and I'm not like a dramatic throwing up kind of person, but we look back and said, I think I was subconsciously just, not sure what was going to happen like Mm. I was probably worried has this brace changed me um am I still good and I ran quite well so it was fine it was just such a process for me to um like almost dare to be different and still be good yeah anyway and completely own it like it was an ugly brace but like it was my brace and I called it Brian so (sighs) I named it (laughs) yeah it was yeah it helped a lot you still have Brian now somewhere Yes, I have Brian and Brian the second because I grew. So I had to get another one Um, and they're both like under my bed somewhere. Um, And when I show people, like, it's just weird that I wore that. It's crazy. Yeah, Yeah. well, I bet you hardly, you know, if you said you you changed a wardrobe and stuff, people wouldn't wouldn't have known. And it's one of those things, probably look up to you even more knowing that, you know, you you kept that to yourself. You didn't feel the need to use it as like an excuse or, you know, a reason why things didn't go your way. So that's really admirable of you to do that. So, you know, well done for that. And and what about now? Like, does it affect you in any way? Like, do you have to do any maintenance work now? Or just that's kind a really of good question. <laughs> yeah. So like, so when I first met my current coaches, uh, Chris Thompson, Gemma Simpson, I remember mentioning to them that I had scoliosis and I said, but, but it's fine. Like it means nothing now. Like I'm totally normal. And then the more we work together, the more we realize, okay, Amelia is a bit different. Um, she's definitely got restrictions. The corset that I had, the, the brace definitely. I mean, if you can imagine, I had a plastic fiberglass corset holding my body together for three years. So at a time where I'm trying to grow, and my body's developing, it was being held in. Yeah. So 
I have a lot of restrictions, particularly in my upper body and my rib cage. Um, and it, it actually affects my lungs sometimes as well. So there are long-term counter effects from that. It was almost like a, a necessary evil that I had to go through to have that brace. And it's definitely affected the way my body functions now. And that's okay. Cause it makes me a little bit different. And I, I think I secretly like that. <laughs> like, even though it's annoying, um, that's fine. And I get physio regularly. Yeah, I was going to say, is there something for someone listening? You know, hey, that's really cool for them to hear that you say that you know it's something different and something that makes you unique. Uh, but B, what? Yeah, what do you do, or what would you suggest someone does if they if they do have scoliosis but they want to you know keep running? So a hundred percent. Like as soon as you're diagnosed get physio treatment, um, mobility work in the back, um, in the rib cage, absolutely everywhere, scapula, shoulders, because that will tend to seize up over time. Um, I never got any physio until I was about 20. I didn't know what physio was. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's no one's fault. It was just, I didn't have the interest and no one told me. So and you didn't have up. any injuries or think pl- pains to really make you force you to go there either. Exactly. It's, people would say if it's not broke, don't fix it. But the thing with me is not many people that I did see actually wanted to touch my back because it was such an unknown. So finding someone that's confident with scoliosis is a real thumbs up and opening up the restrictions that it brings. I think everyone has a different scoliosis. Um, mine's obviously unique to me and I'm learning to understand it now. And Finding someone, yeah, that's confident to open you up, get some mobility there, range of movement would be an awesome start. Um, whether you've been diagnosed today or years ago, um, it's never too late because I started when I was 21 working on it. Um, and there's a long way to go, but it's just all developmental. You've just got to keep going. Okay. All right, great. Thank you for explaining that. Now, when you were age 21, you did have, uh, you know, not just your first injury, but two stress fractures within one year. So what changed or what happened there to suddenly go from no injuries to two pretty major ones? Yeah, again, um, I think when something like that happens, it's never one overriding problem. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, obviously, the first stress, stress fracture I had, I didn't think much of it. And the second one happened literally just an inch further down on the metatarsal. So same foot, same bone, same problem. And suddenly it switched in my head. Okay, there's something actually wrong now. Um, coming back to the why element, I was like, why again? Um, what can, now what can I do? Because it's now slipping out of my control and I need to get it back. And I just remember having this kind of feeling that something wasn't right but I didn't know what it was there was something not right with me and I I wanted to learn and I wanted to see if I could become the senior athlete that I wanted to and I needed kind of answers so I did make the very tough decision to leave my coach at the time Mick Woods and feel like a change of environment a change of coach um, might help that pathway start off so I actually spent about two months coachless on my own, not knowing what to do. And in that two months, I like make a, made a list of all the things that I would have dreamt from a setup. Mm-hmm. And I'm really happy to actually say that I found a hundred percent everything mm-hmm. that was on the list. And it sounds so cheesy, but I was like, this is just perfect for me. And I got in contact with uh, Chris Thompson and Gemma Simpson. And I had no idea if they'd be interested in coaching me. And the first time we met, I turned up with purple hair because I was having like an early life crisis. Like, what, are, what am I doing? Am I am I am I going to find a coach? What, what are you injured at this time when you were meeting them, or was this afterwards? I was like steady running, okay. but I had trained. I was really quite a free agent, just okay. winging winging it as a twenty one year old. Because the decision for my next coaching setup for me was going to be the one if I could, you know, carry on the rest of my senior career and I didn't want to rush it. And it was just so important to me. So I spent, like I said, two months writing the list and doing some research and figuring it out. And this seemed pretty awesome. And it it basically just went from there and we've built up 
a, a relationship and a friendship as well. And um, it's been, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome. awesome. Really, really good. And and you'd say the injuries were the thing that, that kicked you to make that decision. Do you think you'd maybe been thinking about changing your environment before that, but just maybe hadn't had the reason to do it? Or was this just completely out of the blue once the injuries appeared? It definitely had crossed my mind. Um, the set of the order shot, I owe so much to that yeah. environment. Like, we had so much fun throughout the years. We uh, did relays and dressed up uh, for training sessions over the Christmas period. And we competed in so many uh, team events together that it, it did become like a family home. But it's almost having that courage to step out and see what else is there. And it had crossed my mind. Injury number one, I was just focusing on rehabbing that back. And injury number two, why cropped up too many times for me to to really think about staying. I I just had a gut feeling that yeah. I had a lot to work on. And it comes down to a lot of biomechanical things for me at the time. I was a big heel striker. I wasn't using my body as efficiently as what I could have been doing. I was wearing any any shoe that I was given. I wasn't really thinking about footwear. Um, there was no, I guess, guidance as to how I can be the best athlete that I can be. And I probably was a little bit lost and confused and didn't know exactly what I needed. And the longer I've spent with Chris and Gemma, the more I've realized the little holes that were probably missing mm-hmm. and they probably would have got bigger over time if I had left them um, to not start. So um, it was really a tough decision, but it came down to a gut feeling and injury number two uh, probably gave that a little bit of a nudge in the right direction. Yeah. Well, well done to you for listening to your gut because it's it's usually right. And it does kind of make me laugh a little bit that you say injury one and injury two because that's pretty much all you've had. Whereas I'd imagine most people listening, it's like injury 377. Like you, yeah. it's amazing that you've still got just these two. And, and you mentioned, you know, a lot of it being biomechanical and, you know, you've talked before about um, you had to essentially learn to run again. So what did that involve? Um. So Chris and Jim were very clever in their, in their mission on this, I think. Um, so when we first met, we did agree that I wasn't going to be aiming for the Olympics that year. Um, I made it clear that I understood I had to change things. I didn't quite understand what I had to change, but I made it clear that I was willing to take the time to change whatever they thought was necessary. Um, and I basically spent the next year or year and a half with Gemma every day. So at the time, uh, Gemma had just had major surgery on her foot and was rehabbing herself. Mm -hmm. And she very kindly put in a lot of time with me, rehabbing me back, um, looking at the way I ran. Um, And I like to refer to it, or Chris definitely likes to refer to it as an analogy of a car. And like, you've got quite a good car. There's one thing kind of wrong with it, which was the injuries. Um, But instead of just fixing that one thing, we're going to take apart the whole car and then rebuild it up from scratch to see if we can make it better as a whole and not just try and fix that one problem. Mm-hmm. Um, because the stress fracture perhaps could have been solved within the year in terms of how that came about, but we decided to strip everything back mm-hmm. and understand like who is Amelia, how does her body function? Okay, it's a bit of a weird body. <laughs> She's got the spine. And she's also got this bunion on the stress fracture foot, which did not help the situation. And literally building that up from scratch, which took a lot of time and patience on Gemma's part and, and Chris's part. And um, I was in the gym with Gemma most days. Like doing drills or what were you doing in there? Drills and like rehabbing work, um, learning lifting, learning everything. Basically, it was so overwhelming. Um how much I had to take in, but how much almost like she was offering to give me. It was like such valuable time that is rare because now she works full time. Um, and I miss her. It's so annoying, but like, um, good for her for working. But that, <laughs> I got so much one-on-one time with an athlete who has so much experience and knowledge and they were willing to give it to me. And I just felt like so lucky. So yeah. When I graduated that year, instead of going to find a job, I was like, I'm going to carry on with this because 
we're putting in so much energy and time into this and I've learned it so much. I'm just going to gamble and go. And so, yeah, I spent it, I could say, a year and a half with Gemma. She'd be on the bike with me. Um, we've got lots of interesting GoPro footage. Mm-hmm. Some good, some bad. <laughs> so we could, like, compare. And I learned strengths and weaknesses of mine, what it took to be an elite athlete. And slowly but surely in time, Chris became my coach as well. And he started setting these sessions. And we were off from there. And it was such a process. There was no, they did it very uh, cleverly, as I said earlier, because I didn't realize how much we were doing. I just thought this this is great. And they slowly drip fed things in, in time, so that I was picking things up slowly and it wasn't overwhelming. Mm. Um, because I think at the start, if they had said, this is what we're going to give you, it's going to take, as long as it's going to take, what do you think? I probably would have been a bit, shocked yeah. and it would have been overwhelming but um they also did a good job in <laughs> like that summer I raced a bit and they did a good job in just keeping me mentally okay with racing but not racing very well and getting training in but actually we weren't developing my fitness as much as what I thought I was getting sessions done to go hand in hand with the biomechanical changes we're making. And I just thought I was getting fitter. I thought, oh, I'm flying. This is awesome. And then I'd do a track race and be like, what was that? Um, So they did such a good job of just tricking me the whole time, just keeping me happy and making me healthy, like slowly. And I owe so much to them for doing that because they helped my mentality. I wasn't going crazy as like an injured athlete struggling to find herself. I was totally happy and um just getting my drills done basically yeah that's so good to hear and actually um a few months ago well more than a few months ago I had um Dave Collins on the show and he talked about how you find you've got to find the perfect uh coach for you and it's kind of like you want them to be um you know a chef who kind of makes their own kind of judgments and think what works with what what works with what person rather than just following like a recipe um, and, and it sounds like, you know, Gemma and Chris just, you know, gel so well with you and they were able to figure out what you needed and, and it, it's working, which is just so cool to hear. And, um, I have an interesting question for you from one of my, um, listeners, uh, pe- one of the people who support me on Patreon, which is, uh, Mike Kapka wants to know, this is going to be such a good one, your answer. She said, he said, she is inspiring to us, but what is inspiring to her to give her the strength to continue on doing what she's doing? Oh my goodness. That's insane. Um, so what is inspiring to me? Yep. What inspires you to like, keep striving to be your best basically? I can't, ah, it's so cheesy, but I, ah, I'll say it. I I feel like that's what life's about. Yeah. It's what you've got, like. I just, like I said earlier, I wasn't gifted at many other sports. I didn't have an easy go-to and then suddenly running came about. And it's so interesting because um, sometimes when people say to me, oh, is running all you do? And my reply is, is like, what, calling my passion? That's pretty (laughs) good good response. And I'm going to do it for as long as possible. And I'm going to be proud. And also for me, I probably don't have like the most ideal body for a runner, but I'm still doing it. Um, there are so many things about me that probably shouts like you shouldn't be doing this. Um, you know, your back is twisted. You've got restrictions all over. You definitely have breathing problems from time to time because of it. You've got a bunion on your foot, all these kind of quirky things that I'm kind of proud that I have. And I just see it as like a why not? try and I've been given enough hope along the way that it could work out and if it doesn't then I've tried and it's you do it for you like you don't do it for your parents or anyone else like they're all there with you supporting and it's just an opportunity like if it doesn't work out I'll get a real job (laughs) and I'll go and do something else and it's just this is a period of my life that I'm just going to give a go and um but the, the inspirational part of it as well, I, I would say, um, I was asked quite a lot as a kid, like, who's your inspiration? Is it Kelly Holmes or Paula Radcliffe? And 
I used to like feel like I was really clever by saying it's none of them. Um, the people that inspire me are the ones that I see every day, like Aww. hard work. So I guess that is now Chris and Gemma. Um, and everyone that I see doing it too, like that I know personally, it's just, it's such a tough sport and just to see other people give it their best as well. That's just awesome. Um, and see their journeys and that's inspiring for me. So yeah, that was that's a bit of a such a good answer. You could not have come up with a better answer than that. Well oh. done. That's so that's so nice and so sweet as well. Oh, I love that. And I do have one other question from another one of my Patreon uh, listeners, Sally, um, who wants to know: You earned a degree in psychology. Uh, did you work with a sports psychologist while you were returning to running? Um, you know, after these stress fractures. But did that influence your field of study? What made you decide to go for psychology? So for me, it was between psychology and philosophy. I'm definitely a bit of a thinker and my mind wanders a lot. I chose psychology purely because I enjoyed it at school. And like I said before, enjoyment is really important. Mm -hmm. And it fitted really perfectly with the university I wanted to go to and the course they were offering. So I went to Royal Holloway, which um, is a University of London uni. And or college is what people in America might say. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It was just as soon as I went to that university, I thought this is the one for me. The facilities of running, like a bit of a running geek, but I had Virginia Waters and Great Windsor Park to run around, which was awesome. So it was to do with the location as well as the degree. And I guess the degree just gets me thinking. But that I why, didn't probably really, right. Yeah, the why. I'm such a like. Yeah, I always ask why, and it's probably annoys my coaches sometimes. I don't know. But I didn't go to the sports psychology lecture because I was racing. Um, and so when it came up in the exam, you have an option of which questions to answer. And I obviously didn't answer that one because I didn't know what I was talking about. But I'm so glad that I didn't because I never wanted to mix the two. Mm. There's always going to be an opportunity for me to reach out to a psychologist and I could do it at some point but I never did I uh, spoke to my parents a lot and I spoke to people close to me that knew me really well and I probably now speak to Chris and Jem so much that they probably are a psychologist in some way <laughs> um, because they understand me and I'm a bit weird and different and you need someone to get that and who better than people that I see every day and you annoy every day so uh, I never felt the need to, but it's for some people it is the right decision and finding someone that works um, is, the, is the main thing, whether they're a certified psychologist or your mum or dad. Yeah, so true. So <laughs> yeah. true. Thank you so much for explaining that as well. All right, let's talk about um, Fitter Woman. Uh, firstly, what is it and why is this something you wanted to be involved in? So... Um, it's quite a mouthful, so I have written it down, so bear with me. So, um, Fitter Women is a branch under a company named Orico, and Orico is a sports science and data analytics company. And specifically, Fitter Women obviously target female athletes uh, with the aim of providing knowledge and information to help them train and make informed decisions around their menstrual cycle. Um and it's such a taboo subject that I, I love it. Like <laughs> people don't want to talk about it and it's intriguing for me. And it's a topic that I guess is quite relevant. And I would like to, to help it being talked about more and discussed and, and not as much as it should do. So it's a, an awesome app and an awesome company. Um, and I, I know Georgie Broomvelles very well who is the lead scientist behind the app. So it, it was like a quite a natural forming um, business relationship there. And it just seemed where we can go with it and what we can do to help females learn about themselves. And the key word for me is being empowered with your own body, um, not being scared of what it's going to do, just being empowered that you have decisions to make and you can learn about yourself. So have um, you noticed yourself uh, differences in how you feel in training throughout the month? Yeah. So I, as a teenager, was a very heavy menstrual bleeder. 
And the only reason I know this is because I filled out a form with Georgie mm -hmm. and I ticked a lot of boxes and she was like, that's, you're, you're a heavy bleeder, Amelia. And in time, I guess, as you get older, you become less oblivious and more aware of what that means. And I would get a lot of tummy cramps. Um, they were my main symptoms. Um, heavy throbbing legs uh, I had a tendency to get as well. And kind of just not being scared of that is really important and being able to communicate that with other people. Mm -hmm. So when I go back to growing up with Aldershot, my club, um, we were a group of girls. So we would always talk about our periods and if it was hurting or not and how we were feeling. And we would even talk to our coach about it. And it was so normal for me. So I do find it interesting when I hear other females say that they can't talk about it and don't want to learn about it or are too scared to or don't know how, which is why the app is amazing because it's opening up that platform for us too. But like um, privately, right? So you can kind of just look at it yourself. You know, it's not like you, yep. you if you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to share it with the world. You can just look at it on your own on the app, right? Yeah, so it's got an interactive calendar on it where you can start putting in your own period data. Uh, you can put in information like symptoms, nausea, um, levels of heavy bleeding as well, if, if that's an interest to you, um, tiredness, uh, anything. I've got a list of symptoms you can start to log. And in time, the app will kind of pick up your cycle and figure out how your body is working. And in line with that, it will give you uh, nutritional and training tips as well. For example, if you're prone to PMS, it suggests anti-inflammatory foods and particular exercises that you may feel good doing, but it's so subjective that I would always go back to, you have to allow the app to empower you um, to learn about your body. Um, a lot, a lot of female athletes have said to me, well, does it, does it recommend that I shouldn't train? And I was like, no, nope, your coach would be fuming if that was the case. Does it recommend that you might like do an extra recovery day or it doesn't say anything like that? Like if it does, would it say, you know, this is probably going to be a bad, like you might want to push your, you know, hard session back a day. Would it kind of say something like that? It doesn't give like direct uh, instructions like that, because again, it is for the female to decide, but it will suggest what you may be feeling on that day. Um, and what exercise you, you would might be beneficial from. Um, basically, if, if you're feeling inflamed, any kind of exercise would help flush that out. But like, again, if you're racing, if you're an elite athlete and you're about to race and you see that, you know, you're not, maybe not having a good day, it should never be a reason not to do something. It's always to empower you to learn. And sometimes you have good days when you might not expect to. So it just provides in time, it will provide tailored information to what your cycle suggests and you take it on board, learn from it and yeah, just learn about your body really. And talk about it with people if you want, I'm sure you can show your mates and stuff, but it's just, um, I just think it, people don't talk about it enough and I'm unfortunate enough that I spoke about it loads growing up, probably too much. I would say everything to my friends and my coaches and it's surprising that people don't do that. Yeah. So I don't know how many, I don't know what it's like in the USA, whether people talk about it and if the app is well known out there, but I definitely think there's an audience out there for it. Mm -hmm. No. And I was just gonna say, no, I, d I don't think it's really talked about as, as far as I know. Um, well, and as my listeners know, and I don't know how much, you know, uh, Amelia, but like I would always shy away whenever those conversations started, I would back away into the corner and leave the room. Um, because for obvious reasons, I know, you know, this part, uh, I wasn't having a period. So I, I didn't want to get involved because I was scared of people asking me when I didn't know, or I, you know, it was a long memory, uh, rather than actually being a recent, recent memory. But, um, I think it, there definitely is a place for this app and I am going to put it in a link in the show notes for people to check out. Um, if you are interested in learning more about it and just one more thing related to that, um, a lot of my listeners, have found me through my, you know, sharing my story with Amenaria. Um, does it have anything for that, for maybe women who are trying to recover their periods and um, 
you know, this might be uh, more of a question for Georgie, but do you know if there's anything to to help them along the way to kind of track whether things are, are coming back together and getting some symptoms that maybe will eventually lead to the to your period coming back? I would say yes, um, mainly because I, I do have a friend, and so I won't mention her name, who uh, has sometimes not had a period, but she's had symptoms of periods. And I've told her to log them and log the symptoms because you may not have the actual bleed, but your hormones may be still doing something in the background. You can still get the heavy legs. Um, the boobs might hurt. You might be not feeling so good. And that's still a sign that the hormones are doing something. Um, and so don't be afraid if, if you don't have an actual period, it doesn't mean that you're your body's not going through the motions of a cycle or, get, or uh, getting there maybe you know on its way to there. yeah yeah I, I think you're still you might be picking up signs from your body anyway without having to log the actual period um so there's definitely scope for that just still um also eating the right things as well yeah and might increase that okay process all right um well again i will put links in the show notes for anyone to check out i mean this is a really cool thing that um you know, it has been created. Um, and, uh, Georgie, as, um, Amelia mentioned is, you know, the lead scientist here and is doing some, some amazing things. So, um, I hope many of you will consider checking that out, the, the females out there anyway. And, um, (laughs) just to kind of wrap up, what was that? Male coaches could as well, potentially. Male coaches. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Encourage your, your female athletes to, to download it for sure. Um, especially if, you know, you have university level athletes that would probably be ideal for them, you know, to keep track on things. And, and even just thinking about it, actually, um, from an amenorrhea standpoint of things, keeping you more, um, on track of seeing that it's not there. Like for me, it was easy to say, oh, it's been a while. I'll just deal with it later. But if you can then see, oh, okay, my last, the date of my last period was actually three months ago you know, I need to get doing something about this, whereas it's easy to just say, oh, it was, you know, a while ago or whatever. So actually, I think it's a good idea for many different people as well. Um, all right. So just to wrap up here, um, tell us what is next for you now that you've kind of fixed all these issues you were having, kind of built yourself back up from scratch. What's the plan now? So finally, I'm over my virus, which is really good. So I had a bit of downtime this summer and mm-hmm. um, that's absolutely fine because I like I said, I learned a lot about myself and I've learned uh, to be adaptable and be patient and relax when I'm getting in a little bit. Um, so I'm actually having another go at 10K in two weeks' time. I'm doing the Prague 10K road race. Which you will have done um, by the time this comes out. So hopefully it went well. Okay, so fingers crossed. Uh, you <laughs> might see a Instagram post or just, you know, a good sense one, we'll see. Um, but either way, it's a good opportunity for me to get a run out and when you've been through an illness that hasn't quite shifted as quickly as what you want, um, it's just good to get the body open, get it back to racing again. We know I'm healthy, so we've just got to be patient with it and um, see what happens. And hopefully I'll have a cross-country season. I think that's the aim. I'll have to check with Chris. And um, by the time this podcast comes out, I think I will will know the answer to that. Um, I love cross-country and um, I'd love to to have a bit of a season um, and that lead into next year. And, and then we'll see. I think um, yeah, next year might will be interesting uh, to, to see what direction I go in. But um, maybe maybe some longer distances. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get out of the denial phase of 10K. <laughs> I'm doing another one soon. So I'm like, mm, okay. <laughs> I do enjoy it secretly. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Hopefully this this next race in Prague will go well. And, and I'm going to ask you about your um, social media in a minute so people can follow you. But before we get to that, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the Running For Real 4. Earlier in the show, I introduced you to our new sponsor, Bombus. You may remember I did a giveaway with Bombus for my birthday week and I've been raving about them on social media. Why? Because I just love them. Two years of research and development led to multiple improvements of the sock design, performance and comfort, including arch support system that gives you extra support where you need it. 
stay in place technology while not being too loose and they never leave a mark and the seamless toe means that there's no more of that annoying bump on your toes but you want to know the best part one pair sold is one pair donated did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters but you actually can't donate used socks that's why Bombas donates one brand new pair of socks for every pair they sell to date they've sold and donated over nine million pairs Bombas were created for runners, walkers, power loungers, snowboarders, Netflixers, and to me, they feel like you are getting one of those lovely tight squeeze hugs, the ones that just really mean a lot, which I love to give. Some people hate them, but I love them. And here's the bit you want to know. Running for your listeners, get 20% off your first order by going to bombas.com forward slash running for real. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com forward slash running for real and you'll get 20% off your first order with code running for real with the number four. By now you've heard me talking about how much I love body health perfect amino for recovery but did you know that if you try it and don't like it you can get your money back 100% of it that's how confident they are in what they are making and how much it will help you to recover and hopefully by now you know how much I appreciate it especially as I'm trying to get back to running after having a baby and let's just say things break down a little bit easier than they did before so I definitely need them to help me stay healthy. Perfect Amino is made of the eight essential amino acids our bodies need them to function and this will help it kind of work as it should be and as a vegan sourced non-GMO gluten-free soy and dairy free product you don't have to worry about food allergies affecting your ability to recover. So with marathon season fast approaching, give yourself the best chance of getting to that start line healthy as those intense workouts and accumulated miles begin to take their toll. Remember, you can use coupon code TINA10 to get 10% off at bodyhealth.com. What do you have to lose? All right, Amelia, four more questions for you. Can you tell us about maybe a photo on social media? Maybe it was just a photo you took, something that Uh, went up somewhere that wasn't quite what it seemed maybe the photo showed something and there was something else going on behind the scenes or kind of give us a bit of a a real insight into into something you've shared or on my social media page yeah or even if you just took it and then decided not to use it oh god oh there's so many kind of what like you know like I mean embarrassing pictures like maybe um you know you uh took a picture of you running and your, you know, the picture look made you look really strong, and and you know, everyone commented like, "Oh, you look amazing!" But you know, maybe five minutes before that, you were you know really struggling, or you were kind of saying like, "Oh, this is too hard," or something. So the the photo kind of doesn't show quite what was happening in that moment. Well, this is going to sound so cynical, but I'm pretty sure that's what happens on social media all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why. I wanted this question because I thought you know people do this all the time so it would be good to kind of show that everyone does that sometimes like everyone kind of paints the best picture so if you could share with one with us where maybe there was a, a little something can I quickly have a look sure let's answer the next question while you're while okay, you're doing yeah. that. all right what about a, a running for real moment for you um, a moment something you did or something that runners only get you'll only understand if you're a runner Oh, you'll only understand if you're a runner. Uh, pick a good leaf. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, that works. Get it? Okay. Good, good. Okay, cool. Um, all right. And what about a uh, high moment for you? For me, the high moments are always the unexpected ones where you didn't quite see it coming and it caught you off guard. Um, and I would say my most recent one would be winning the European cross country trials um because of the journey that I've had with Chris and Gemma up until that point for me it meant so much and to have them there on the day and to yeah to win in in the way that I did and it's special because we know how much we've gone through together and then to have them there and I I was just wanting to try and qualify it was really quite an innocent situation and that kind of escalated quite quickly um so yeah, it just, those kind of moments mean so much to me. It's the people that make it a moment and they were there. So yeah, that was awesome. Absolutely. You've got some really good inspirational words going. All right. And what oh. do you tell yourself when you stand on the start line of a race? Um, what do I tell myself when I stand on the start line? 
uh, I probably just tell myself to have a bit of confidence. Um, that, that does come as soon as the gun goes, that is there, but it's kind of like reminding yourself of everything you've put in to get to this point and all of those grueling sessions, you know, you've put in the work. It's like, you know how to work hard. Uh, I feel like every runner does and uh, having confidence that it's all in the bag for that kind of race um, and to execute. I think execute is quite a big word for me as well. Okay, cool. That's a good, that's a powerful word. I haven't heard anyone mention that before. Um, all right. So what is this photo you're going to share with us? Uh, so it's on my Instagram and it's a picture of me sitting at the Grand Canyon and I'm looking really happy and kind of posing and basically I'm laughing in it, but I'm laughing in it because my top had fallen down just before <laughs> and, and it was very breezy up there, obviously. And I was just with some really good girlfriends of mine and I just was mortified because you, everyone's out there with binoculars and my top fell down and I picked it back up and I carried on posing because... That's what I, you know, enjoy doing with my girlfriends, and I just the show must go on. Yeah. But like, I really hope that no one, you know, you just think I wonder if anyone got a snap because oh, yeah. it was oh, it was in public. But oh, no, oh, well. yeah, I hear. You. I once I was um, running in a in a trail in Philadelphia. Um, for those of you who know Philadelphia, I was on uh, Valley Green uh, or Wissahickon Trail, and. Um, it was winter and I really needed to, to pee to go to the toilet. So I was like, okay, there's this bridge. So I'm just going to go, you know, by the side of the bridge. So the people on the trail can't see me. So pulled down my, um, tights, uh, started going, looked up and there was two people on the other side of the river, just like looking at me. And I was like, oh, that just happened and so I like pulled my pants up like ran away but um yeah they, de- they definitely saw me and I was just like humiliated yeah but you know. question. <laughs> yep um okay well what about if people want to find out more about you where can they go find you to follow along in the future so all my social media handles are just my name so at Amelia Goretzka, um, the spelling of my name is pretty funky. Yeah, I was going to say, so, spell the whole thing for people just so they, they can write it down as they go. The first name is E-M-E-L-I-A and G-O-R-E-C-K-A. Great. A funky one. Yep. Well, I, and also because Amelia, I think over here, I don't know about in the UK, but in the US, it's definitely more spelt with an A. So I think people would spell it with an A yeah. typically. My mum spelled it wrong on my birth certificate, so I actually don't know how it was meant to be. She's going to kill me for saying this, but I think it was obviously a tough day. She's just <laughs> <in> birth. <laughs> well, I can vouch for it. It is a tough day when you give birth now, so I can I can agree with that there. But um, either way, we love you exactly as you are. So thank you so much for being honest with us, for sharing your story, for being inspiring and having the perfect answer to so many questions. Um, you know, Keep up the good work. I really look forward to following along in the future. Thank you for having me and for being my first podcast. Yeah, this is fun. Yes. For a first podcast interview ever, I would say that she did really well at showing us who she really is. I loved her answer to Mike Kapta's question about what inspires her. Remember, I could be answering your question in a future episode with a guest if you support me on Patreon. You will get to see an ongoing list of scheduled interviews and know up to three months ahead of time who is coming on. You can go to the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 80, or you can find out more at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash running for real, the number four. I hope you do go on to follow Amelia in the future. She's such a good person. And if you didn't love her answer about a photo that doesn't quite show the real thing. I don't know what else you could say. It's so true. And you wouldn't hear that answer from an elite very often. I just loved her so much. And remember, ladies listening, go download Fitter. It is a great app. And I actually really look forward to using it once I stop breastfeeding. Next week, we have the one and only Dean Karnaz is coming on. I don't need to tell you much about him. The name in itself is pretty legendary. So I'm not ruining anything for you. Be sure to come check it out next week. Or so you don't have to remember, you can subscribe using your favorite podcast player app. They will let you subscribe and it will come right to you next Friday. Until then, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. 
Be sure to check out TinaMuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.